Welcome to the Panzer Museum Munster and today we will talk about why anti-tank guided missiles so far haven't replaced guns in tanks. I originally recorded the museum's part of this in 2020, but since in the last days anti-tank guided missiles are more often used than seen, I thought it would be a good time to finally finish this video. We are aware that this is mainly about anti-tank guided missiles fired from tanks, yet in many cases there is an overlap in capabilities and weapon systems. For instance, for the Javelin there are infantry and vehicle versions, whereas for the N-Law there is no vehicle version from what I know. During the Cold War there were some serious debates and decisions about replacing regular tank guns with guided missiles for most countries. One major exception was the United Kingdom. In a way this whole affair at various points and depending on the country is also linked to the switch from rifled to smoothbore guns in tanks. One reason why the US Army did not pursue the development of the smoothbore delta gun was that those in charge of US tank development became beguiled by the perceived performance of guided missiles. This manifested itself in 1957 when the Arkov Armament for Future Tanks and Similar Combat Vehicles Committee, established by the US Army Chief of Staff to review the development of tanks, recommended that future tanks should be armed with guided missiles. This led to the M551 Sheridan and the M60A2, which were both armed with the Schiller Leg missile system. These tanks were not really successful and abandoned after a few years. The French had a similar system with the Acre guided missile, although they mounted the system on an AMX-30 tank as a prototype, it was not further developed. If you look at the Soviet side, there were very similar developments, apparently here the highest level of the state interfered. Nikita Khrushchev doubted the future of tanks due to the effectiveness of anti-tank guided missiles. Khrushchev's views did not put an end to the development of other types of tanks, but they steered some of it in a new direction. This manifested itself from 1957 onwards in a flurry of designs of tanks armed with missiles instead of guns. Initially the Soviets put their anti-tank missiles on vehicles like the BRDM due to the large fins for stabilization. They also created a tank destroyer based on the T-62 chassis armed with missiles, similar to the German Raketenjagdpanzer and the Jaguar tanks, which I discussed with Jens Wehner in this video on my second channel. Yet unlike the German tanks only a small number were built, one author notes that two battalions were fielded, which is very small for the Soviet army and that the tanks were withdrawn from service in 1970. Yet the Soviet development clearly didn't end here. Interestingly enough, again the smoothbore guns are mentioned in conjunction with anti-tank guided missiles. The artillery community preferred smoothbores, especially the influential Marshal Kuleshov, who headed the main missile and artillery directorate, that supervised gun development. A further incentive for sticking with smoothbore designs was the initial efforts to develop tube-fired guided anti-tank projectiles. As a result, the D81 125mm smoothbore eventually emerged as the preferred armament for the next generation Soviet tank. According to Saloga, the US developments on the M551 Sheridan and the M62A tanks also influenced the Soviets. For this, the Sosna program was started, which was the integration of the Cobra anti tank guided missile system into the autoloader of the T64. The Sosna package was accepted for service on September 3, 1976 as the T-64B. The advanced electronics in the T-64B led to a sharp price increase from 194,000 rubles for the T-64A to 318,000 rubles for the T-64B gun missile tank. Due to the high cost of the Cobra missile, the Sosna was manufactured in two configurations, the T-64B with the Cobra missile system and the T-64B1 Object 437A without the Cobra system. More importantly, while Western countries discontinued the practice, the Soviet Union went for a hybrid approach. Only the Soviet Army continued the development of gun-launched guided missiles, which it started in 1962 or 1963 and which resulted in a whole series of missiles, mostly laser beam riders, that were fired 
from guns ranging from 100mm gun of the T-55 to the 125mm gun of the T-90. So they even upgraded older tanks to be able to use anti-tank guided missiles, although in a limited number. The Russian Federation continued this practice and their tanks have missile launch capability too, but the real question is how many missiles the Russian army can afford right now. In his book about the T-90, Saloga noted the following. The list price per round in the early 1990s was 40,000 US dollars, which limited the distribution of the Reflex missile to an average of 4 per tank. As you can see, this was not just a theoretical debate, as is illustrated by the various developments, different solutions and realized projects. Of course, now we need to look at the benefits and drawbacks of anti-tank missiles for tanks instead of a gun. Let us look at the benefits missiles have over guns. Now be aware this is a broad overview and in some cases the data is limited to a certain time frame. There were some serious technical changes over the years as such some of these points might be correct for a certain time frame but wrong for another time frame. Yet some points from the past are still valid today. The first aspect is that missiles generally had a far higher penetration value against steel armor since they used hollow charge, also called shape charged warheads. These not only had a high penetration value, but it was independent of the speed of the projectile. So the penetration did not decrease over distance, like with regular guns that relied on kinetic energy for penetration that is dependent on speed. The high opinion of shape charges contributed to the recommendation made in 1957 by the US Army Armament for Future Tanks and Similar Combat Vehicles committee that future tanks should be armed with guided missiles, which would depend of course on shaped charge warheads for defeating armor. Nowadays the answer is far less straightforward here, since there is a lot of different equipment on the market in both missiles and tanks. The latter often with various upgrades as well. Basically this would at least require a video of its own to discuss. So here is just a short overview on what has changed. Be aware this is out of necessity simplified, so keep that in mind. First, modern armor piercing fin stabilized decarding severed ammunition achieves also very high penetration values. Modern composite armor to a limiting degree protects against such ammo. Second, modern composite armor is mainly designed to protect against shape charges, whereas older armor that consists of steel only is not. Third, Shape charged warheads can be defeated with explosive reactive armor. Note such armor is add on armor that usually looks like small boxes. Yet, fourth, there are also tandem warheads that are designed to defeat explosive reactive armor. Fifth, there are also anti tank guided missiles like the Javelin that perform a top attack, and tanks generally have very weak top armor. Generally, I would say that the benefits of the missile had decreased substantially, if I'm not mistaken. Another important aspect was and is the longer range of anti-tank guided missiles. Generally the outrange tank guns. And as mentioned the penetration power is independent of the range. Yet this factor must be seen in combination with the higher chance to hit. Important here again, the higher chance to hit changed quite dramatically due to modern fire control systems. So here we go back in time and look at the accuracy of anti-tank guided missiles of the second generation. So the early hot and tow missile systems. In this graph we have the probability to hit on the vertical axis, the range is on the horizontal axis. Here we have the plot for the guns with simple and advanced fire control. Here we have the plot for anti-tank guided missiles with manual and automatic guidance. We see that there is a significant advantage for the anti-tank guided missiles at longer range. Be aware that this is historical data, sadly I don't have similar data for the current tank guns and anti-tank guided missiles. Yet as so often the devil is in the details here and in combat there are a lot of factors to consider, something we tackle in the next section. Yet if we look at modern battle tanks like the Leopard 2 here, we notice the main armament is still a gun. So what are the benefits of the guns in relation to the missile? In other words, what are the drawbacks of anti-tank guided missiles? The first major drawback of missiles is that they are rather slow. About the Yom Kippur War, Alaric Searle notes the following. 
Given that the flight time per 1000 meter was at least 10 seconds, it was possible to suppress the 83 SEGA teams even during the IDF counterattacks, which hit the Egyptian columns from one or both flanks. Of course, the 83 SEGA entered service in 1963 and there are a lot of different models. Generally, it is on the lower end with a maximum speed of about 115 to 130 meters per second. Yet even the contemporary n law is about 200 meters per second. And toes range from 267 to 320 meters per second. Also be aware that these are maximum speeds. A missile takes some time to isolate, unlike a regular gun, at least when fired by infantry. If the missiles are launched from a tank gun, at least the Soviet 9M119 reflex missiles is fired with a propellant charge according to Zaloga. Still, it is far slower than a regular tank round. Now for the Rheinmetall RH120 that is used in the Leopard 2, we have the following numbers. For the L44, so 44 times the caliber size, we have 1530 to 1650 meters per second. And for the L55, we have 1650 to 1750 meters per second. So the highest value for the tow is still a fifth of the tank gun with just a 44 caliber length. Or in other words, if the Leopard 2 fires at you at a range of 1600 meters away, you have one second to await. For a tow, it is theoretically at least five seconds. At least since this is based on just the maximum speed. A more realistic number is given by Nicholas the Chief de Moran at a talk to the US military. He noted that the tow missile would need 13 seconds to reach a target at the range of 2500 meters. If it was fired from a tank gun, it would probably be faster than that, but still far slower than a regular gun. The limited speed is a problem in several regards. It also depends on the technology of the missile. Most missiles are guided by an operator. This means if the operator is sufficiently engaged before the missile hits the target, he likely misses. Sega teams were dealt with by concentrated small arms fire from the mechanized infantry mounted in M113s, who simply aimed at the source of a Sega missile, thereby disrupting the control of the missile by the operators. Of course, if it is a fire and forget system like the n -Law, this is less of an issue, but then the tank can still evade. The last part is particularly important for the next drawback, namely that these missiles are rather easy to detect. The launch generates quite some smoke and heat. This is less of a problem when it is fired from inside a tank, but the heat does not end once the missile is flying. With modern thermal imaging technology, this increases the chances for the tank crew to detect and evade at longer ranges. For the end law with an effective firing range of 20 to 800 meters, this is less of a problem. Yet while such a range is okay for infantry weapons, it is not for a tank gun and other anti-tank guided missiles have far longer ranges. As previously mentioned, one benefit of the missiles is the longer range. Now here is a bit of a problem. In some cases this does not work out, geographically. In Central Europe, 50% of the targets are likely to appear at 1000 meters or less, and within much of this range guns have a higher hit probability than even second generation missiles. Again, in that regard the number might have changed, but from what I know, tank guns got more accurate due to better fire control systems that reduce the gap between the two systems. This range issue becomes even more important if we factor in that tank guns have about twice the rate of fire as missiles. This means that the chances of scoring a hit increases for guns, since the regular chance to hit graph is based only on a first hit chance, not subsequent shots. Keep in mind here the long travel time of missiles as well. There is one more drawback for missiles when it comes to range. They have a minimum range. Again, this one is highly dependent on technology. For instance, early missiles like the ET3 Sega or French SS11 had sometimes a minimum range of 500 meters, whereas for the HOT it has been reduced to 75 meters. Another problem is that missile systems are generally more complex. This has several drawbacks. It increases the cost, it decreases reliability, and it also increases training time. About the cost, Ogar Kiev Schiffs in his 1991 book notes 
that a second generation anti-tank guided missile costs about 20 times that of an armor piercing round. Of course, modern fire control systems for tank guns with thermal imagers are also very expensive. Yet such equipment is paid once, so one has higher one-off costs, whereas fired ammo accounts for running costs. An armor piercing round, even an armor piercing fin stabilized discarding sabot is a rather simple system compared to a guided anti-tank missile. As such, the reliability for the missile is generally lower. Like it, this is even more important if ammo is stored for a long time as well. About training, although there are now also anti-tank guided missiles that have a fire and forget system, keep in mind that these are still rare. Yet at the same time, modern fire control systems probably require more training as well. So this point could be irrelevant or even reversed. To summarize, although at times the benefits of anti-tank guided missiles in a tank clearly were seen as an alternative weapon to the regular tank gun, in the end, the tank gun prevailed. Looking at the strengths and weaknesses now, it might seem odd why the missile was considered as a replacement. Maybe the analysis was flawed, or technology progressed more rapidly in directions that favored guns. It should be added here that the Soviet approach of firing both regular gun ammunition and missiles out of the barrel might become more prevalent with users of Western equipment as well. Israel has developed an anti-tank guided missile called Lahat that can be used with the Rheinmetall RH120 gun used in the Leopard 2. Big thank you here to Tech Arrow and many miles away for reviewing the script and providing vital input. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the video. I hope you enjoyed this episode on why anti-tank guided missiles haven't replaced regular tank guns as main armament so far. Big thank you here to the Panzer Museum Munster for the invitation. Special thanks to all my Patreon and subscribers and supporters for making trips like this possible. As always, source the list in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.